Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for being here. I have no announcements to make, so we'll go straight to your questions. Julie. Thank you. Um, I wanted to see if you had anything you could tell us today on the location of Edward Snowden, um, and more generally, if he's in Hong Kong or some other country that has an extradition treaty with the United States, is it the White House's expectation that that country would send him back to the U.S.? As was the case yesterday, uh, I am not going to discuss the subject of a recently opened investigation. So the whereabouts of this individual, his status, any details about the investigation, I would refer to uh, questions about those matters. I would refer to the Department of Justice and the FBI. On the broader question, though, if he is in a country, or if someone were to be in a country that had an extradition treaty with the United States, would it be the White House's expectation that that country would set up? Again, I think that, that goes to the case itself, and we're going to wait for the investigation to proceed before we weigh in uh, with that kind of assessment. This one then. Was the president aware uh, that this was an individual that uh, the U.S. was looking at or his whereabouts when he met with President Xi uh, during the China summit over the weekend? I believe the answer to that is no. Okay. So this did come up in that, in part of those discussions? Not that I'm aware of. Thank you. And then on uh, a separate topic, uh, can you explain a little bit of the administration's thinking on the decision to uh, stop pushing for changes on the morning after pill availability? Uh, Julie, if I could just say on the, in the last one, I think I mentioned yesterday that the President was uh, made aware of the revelations about the individual taking responsibility for these leaks by senior staff aboard Air Force One uh, after departing California. So uh, on, the, uh, on the other question, um, uh, on Plan B, could you ask, ask me again and all? I just wanted to know what the thinking uh, behind the decision last night was. Well, twofold. You know what the President's personal views are. He expressed them here in this room. And he supported the decision by Secretary Sebelius uh, with regards to uh, the use of this medication by young girls, ages 10 and 11, uh, and the lack of sufficient data, in his view. And so he supported Secretary Sebelius's decision, having not played a role in the making of the decision. Uh, you know, we have been through a legal process, and the Court has ruled against the administration an appeals court, as you know. Uh, and that ruling means that, or meant that, uh, Plan B would be immediately available uh, to anyone of any age. And it was uh, the decision to, uh, given that uh, court ruling, that uh, to proceed with making the simpler version of Plan B available, because at the very least that uh, addresses some of the concerns about uh, the ability of uh, younger girls to use that medication. So uh, the ruling uh, came in against the administration, immediately made uh, a form of Plan B available, and it was the decision uh, that the President supports to uh, proceed to making sure that the FDA uh, approved the simpler version of Plan B. Yes? What steps is the administration taking to ensure with um, defense contractors who work on intelligent issues that um, their employees, that, that they have adequate safeguards against rogue insiders? Well, there are a couple of pieces to that question, some of them, some of which have been answered by uh, the DNI, the Director of National Intelligence. The, so there, there are several, first of all, there's a damage assessment that's ongoing. Uh, secondly, uh, it is important to note that when it comes to contractors, they uh, swear an oath to protect classified secrets uh, just as government workers do. Uh, and uh, that is important to remember. Uh, in terms of procedures that are in place, I think I would refer you to uh, the various agencies uh, that uh, have contractors that deal with classified information, Department of Defense, NSA, CIA, and the like in terms of the procedures that are in place or any procedures that they may be uh, engaged in now in the wake of these leaks. Uh, but again, I think it's important to note that, that individuals who take an oath to protect uh, classified information are bound by it, whether they are government employees or uh, contracted employees. 
So is there anything new that the administration is doing then in terms of seeking extra assurances from contractors in the wake of what's happened? Again, I think I would refer you to the agencies that uh, employ contractors who have access to once they have gone through all the rigorous background checks and, and, and other procedures to uh, give them the security clearances that they have uh, and, and that they take the oath that they do uh, for any post-revelation measures they may be taking. Um, and if I could ask you about um, President Putin today, he said um, he has no doubts about Iran's nuclear program. What do you make of those comments? What does the administration make of those comments and the importance of them given um, Russia's um, place in these discussions about Iran's nuclear program? About Iran's? I mean, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I haven't seen those comments, but uh, so maybe you can characterize them for me further. No doubts in that <clears throat> Iran's pursuit is for uh, yeah. non-peaceful means, military right. means? Yeah. Well, that's certainly our view, and it's been our view that Iran needs to abide by its international obligations. Sorry, no doubts that um, uh, in that Iran is is um, pursuing this for nefarious intentions. Um, no doubts in terms of he, he said he has no doubts that Iran in, is pursuing a, a nuclear program for peace. <coughs> oh, okay, so that's the opposite, the opposite of what yes. uh, I thought you were saying. Our views haven't changed. I'm not aware of the comments by. Uh, the Russian president that you uh, just relayed to me, but I would say that uh, Iran has failed to live up to its obligations under uh, international law to uh, prove that its pursuit of uh, nuclear technology is for peaceful means. Uh, there is ample evidence to the contrary, uh, and we are engaged in a process with our allies to uh, try to bring about a change in behavior by the regime in Tehran. And as part of that process, we have instituted the most stringent and broad sanctions regime in the history of the world. And that is both unilaterally and with our allies and with uh, through the United Nations uh, and through different means. Um, we have said that there remains time for Iran to choose a path of engaging with the international community and abandoning its nuclear weapons ambitions, uh, but that that uh, time is not unlimited. Uh, and we obviously monitor the situation very closely uh, with our allies. Dan. Thank you, Jay. Uh, does the President believe that, that keeping America safe is more important than keeping the information of, of Americans secret? As you heard the President say, on Friday, he believes that we must strike a balance between uh, our security interests and our uh, desire for privacy. He made clear that you can not have 100 percent security and 100 percent privacy, and thus we need to find that balance. He believes, uh, as Commander-in-Chief, that the oversight structures that are in place to uh, ensure that there is, uh, you know, the proper review of the kinds of programs that we have in place authorized by Congress through the Patriot Act uh, and FISA uh, do strike that balance. He also said that he, under, he, he understands and believes it is entirely legitimate that some may disagree. Some may believe that that balance uh, ought to be shifted in one direction or the other from where it currently is. And he welcomes the debate about that. Uh, he mentioned this uh, very explicitly in his speech to the National Defense University several weeks ago uh, on the broader topics of our counterterrorism programs. Uh, but he spoke spe specifically about surveillance and the balance that we need to strike between uh, security and privacy, between security and inconvenience. Uh, and that is a worthy discussion to have uh, in public. Uh, and he welcomes that debate because it's an important debate. And I think it's important to note that we have had this debate every time the Patriot Act has come up for passage and reauthorization. And it has been a spirited debate with uh, strongly held opinions expressed by uh, people who are opposed to uh, the 
structures that are in place that have been authorized by bipartisan majorities in Congress that are overseen by the courts, uh, as well as internally by the executive branch. Uh, so that's important, and it's healthy, and we should continue to have that debate. But, but isn't it true, though, that, that security at times will have to take the back seat to, um, or rather privacy will have to take the back seat to security? If there are yeah, I think security. I've answered the question that we have to find a balance between those two and that we cannot have uh, if we hope to uh, successfully protect ourselves 100 percent privacy, that there has to be some modest concession to uh, the need for information as we pursue terrorists who mean to do harm to the country and to take the lives of Americans, uh, but that we need to make sure that the programs we have in place are properly overseen, that they are legal, that they are authorized by Congress, and they are authorized by the courts. And that is the case here, uh, and has been the case with the discussion that we've had in the wake of these revelations. Uh, but it, it, again, I think I just want to emphasize that uh, the fact that these systems are in place and the oversight exists and it is uh, significant uh, does not mean that the, the conversation has ended in the President's view. It means that we need to continue to debate this. And as I said yesterday, uh, you know, the, the, this, this goes to sort of broader issues about uh, our nation and, and, and the world in terms of the uh, nature of electronic communications and, and uh, broader issues of privacy. So this is a, an important debate for us as a nation. It's important in the President's views that we have the kinds of debates that we've had in Congress over the Patriot Act and its reauthorization, the improvements to the Patriot Act that ensured that there was oversight uh, that had not existed prior to 2006, I believe, uh, and then the measures that have been taken to ensure that uh, you know, there's judicial and, and executive branch and congressional oversight since. So, the President certainly does not welcome the way that this debate has been, uh, has, has been get, uh, earned greater attention in the last week, the, the leak of classified information about sensitive programs that uh, are uh, important in our fight against terrorists who would do harm to Americans, uh, is a problem. And it is, it is a great concern. Uh, but the debate itself is legitimate and should be engaged. And about the uh, congressional picnic that has been postponed, what was behind that? Is sequester playing into that decision at all? No, this was, a, uh, I think, had to do with the President's schedule and the fact that he is, as you know, uh, taking uh, several overseas trips uh, uh, in June, and uh, that necessitated uh, trying to postpone this. Yes. Uh, the top Republican on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Senator Corker of Tennessee, is urging the President to arm Syrian rebels at the earliest possible time. What is your response, and is uh, Senator Corker correct when he says the President is facing a critical policy decision on Syria this week? The President has been uh, evaluating his policy options on Syria uh, repeatedly for uh, some time. Uh, there are a number of issues that we've discussed here that have to do with uh, the use, potentially, of chemical weapons by the Assad regime and the need to build on the evidence that uh, we have already accumulated that that, in fact, has taken place. Then there is the issue of how best to achieve our policy goal, uh, uh, which is a negotiated political settlement uh, to an authority in Syria that can provide security and stability, that can protect the rights of all Syrians, and uh, that can secure unconventional and advanced conventional weapons, that can counter terrorist activity, and that can keep the state and its institutions preserved to the extent possible. Uh, this is so that's the policy goal that we have as a nation, a policy goal we have with our allies and partners on this issue, and then we evaluate the options available to us in a very challenging situation based on whether or not they will bring us closer or inadvertently move us further away from achievement of that policy goal. The President is, as you know, and as he has said, reassessing those options. Uh, they, one of the options that he has not taken off the table and that we continue to assess is the potential of providing arms to uh, the opposition. We already provided an enormous amount of assistance to both the Syrian people through humanitarian assistance as well as uh, to the opposition, but we evaluate every other option. The one, you know, exception to that, although all, all options remain on the table, is the President's made clear that he does not foresee a circumstance where uh, we would have American boots on the ground in Syria. And what about the timing? What about this week? Is there a policy decision that we should be talking about? Uh, you know, I, I don't have any policy announcements to preview for you or forecast. 
uh, except to say that the situation in Syria is obviously serious and it continues to deteriorate, uh, and that is of great concern to the President uh, and to uh, everyone which, with an interest in uh, Syria and the region. Uh, and we continue to discuss this with our allies and partners. Did the President or his administration send any messages to Nelson Mandela or his family this week? I, I'm not aware of any communications from the White House where obviously uh, he is and, and the First Lady is and, and we all are uh, concerned about uh, Nelson Mandela's health and, and wish him and his family well and hope uh, that he recovers. Can I follow on that, please? Yes. Um, was the Johannesburg part of the trip um, the President's going to take uh, later this month basically for the President to go see Nelson Mandela? No, April. I, I think that that uh, understates significantly the importance of South Africa uh, and the bilateral relationship we have with that country. There is uh, every, every reason to visit South Africa on a visit to, to Africa. But I don't have any specifics on the schedule or the plan for the President's uh, trip beyond what we've put out already. Well, the way I understood it that um, Johannesburg was added, it was supposed to be Cape Town, for South Africa, and then Johannesburg was added, and Nelson Mandela at that time was in Johannesburg. And the question was how well, this is... Again, I don't have any specifics on a schedule that's still coming together to provide to you, except to say that uh, we're obviously concerned about and mm -hmm. Nelson Mandela's health and, and wish him well and, 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 and a speedy recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, but we obviously also have a very important relationship with South Africa. When was the last time President Obama uh, talked with Nelson Mandela, particularly as both of them really are the essence of the first black president for the United States and for South Africa? I, I, I don't have an answer to that question in terms of the last time they spoke. I know they did meet when uh, uh, Mr. You know, president Obama was a senator, but uh, and the first lady uh, was in South Africa and met with Nelson Mandela when she uh, visited South Africa uh, a few years ago, I believe. But uh, I don't I don't know when the president last spoke with uh, with Mr. Mandela. And do you feel uh, a kinship with him because of their historical placing in uh, in these two respective countries? I, I think the president has written about and spoken about uh, Nelson Mandela in the past. So I wouldn't you know I would point you to the, what he said about you know this this. Um, you know, hugely significant figure uh, in South African, African, and global history. Yes? Uh, just to be clear, does the United States want to prosecute Mr. Snowden? There is an investigation underway, and it is for the investigators to determine whether or not uh, crimes have been committed and to, to decide uh, what charges, if any, will be brought, and I will not get ahead of that process. You haven't so far. We have said. Well, Bill, I, I appreciate the opportunity to glibly get ahead of a, uh, an important investigation, but I'll pass on it. I think that we have made clear that uh, we have very serious concerns about the leak of classified information about programs that are very important to our national security. Uh, but on this specific investigation and the status of the individual who's being investigated, uh, I will leave that comment on that to the investigators. Speaker, Speaker Boehner today called Snowden a traitor. Would you go that far? Again, I won't comment uh, specifically on uh, someone who's under investigation. I won't, con you know, characterize him or his status. Uh, we believe it is the uh, uh, appropriate posture to take to let the investigation move forward and let the determination about uh, where that investigation will go and whether any charges will be brought and what those charges might be if they are brought to the investigators, to the FBI and the Department of Justice. As we've talked about this debate, you, you've said the President welcomes the debate and you've referred to his speech at the National Defense University. One of the takeaways from that speech, <coughs> in his own words, was that he felt it would be a mistake for the U.S. to stay on what he called a war footing, that it was sort of self-defeating. Isn't the lesson that we've learned over the last couple of weeks after that speech that we still are on a war footing? In fact, he's expanded surveillance to prevent terror attacks. So when you cite that speech, isn't there a bit of a contradiction there? When he was telling the public two or three weeks ago, we're kind of ramping down. We don't want a war footing anymore. The expanded surveillance suggested we still are on a war footing. Well, I think you're conflating a number of issues here, Ed, and it's not, uh, you know, that was a, a fairly uh, long and detailed speech uh, that uh, delved well, into a number just of... was that we're scaling, that we're not on a war footing. Well, right? I think what the, one of the, uh, with regards to that, 
we have, as a nation, been in active hot wars for more than a decade. And the President, keeping his commitment uh, from when he ran for this office, ended the war in Iraq. And he is winding down the war in Afghanistan. But it remains the case that we uh, continue to aggressively pursue Al Qaeda and its affiliates. Uh, and uh, it is absolutely his obligation as Commander-in-Chief to do so and to ensure that we have the tools necessary to do that. It is also his view and his insistence that those tools that we have and that we use uh, are subject to oversight and to uh, – and are, are uh, carried out and are used in a way that is uh, – that, that keeps faith to our laws and our values, uh, with our laws and our values. So uh, I don't think there's any inconsistency at all there. We, we remain – in, a, in, in conflict with Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda, even though it is greatly diminished, core Al Qaeda in particular, remains a threat. And uh, Al Qaeda's affiliates remain a threat. We've certainly discussed that quite uh, a bit, uh, whether it's in Yemen or elsewhere. Uh, and and uh, the President uh, is taking every action necessary as Commander in Chief to ensure. Uh, that we are adequately protected from that threat. One other topic. CBS broke a story a couple of days ago about the State Department, about uh, a memo uh, from an official in the State Department Inspector General's office claiming that a special agent had, quote, determined that Ambassador Gutman in Belgium was ditching his security detail to engage prostitutes and to allegedly uh, solicit sex with children. Mm -hmm. He has sharply denied that. Is the President confident in that denial to keep Ambassador Gutman in place? And what is the President's reaction to well, let me say a the State things. Department allegedly shutting this down? These, these allegations are currently under investigation by an Independent Inspector General. There is no final report on these inquiries by the Independent Inspector General. And as is, uh, as, uh, is in keeping with the position we take when we are dealing with Independent Inspector General investigations or audits, we will not comment until we have seen the results of that investigation. And there's a process in place for reviewing any sort of allegation of misconduct, the likes of which you mentioned. Uh, and uh, we believe that that process should unfold under regular order, and we're not going to prejudge anyone or anything before all the facts are determined. That said, I want to make clear the President has zero tolerance for misconduct uh, by any government employee. And I think his t zero tolerance for misconduct has been demonstrated uh, amply throughout his presidency. Uh, but we're not going to prejudge uh, based on, uh, you know, unfinished uh, investigations by an independent IG. I appreciate that distinction. One last thing on this, which is you say it's still under investigation, the allegations uh, against the ambassador, but there are also allegations in this memo against Patrick Kennedy, who's a very high State Department official, suggesting that he killed the original investigation, sort of blocked it to, to protect Ambassador Gutman and maybe others. Mm -hmm. My question is, does uh, under Secretary Kennedy's conduct here, is that under investigation as far as the White House? Uh, all, I believe all of these matters that you raise are uh, under investigation, mm -hmm. active investigation by the independent IG at the State Department. Uh, and uh, we will not prejudge the outcome of an ongoing inquiry like that. On that same topic, Jay, is it appropriate that the State Department has gone so long, I think since 2008, without a full time Inspector General? Uh, Look, I, I, I don't have any information for you about the staffing of the IG's office, but uh, you know, I'll have to take the question. Yeah, that, uh, that would be for I mean, What I can tell you is that, again, if this is related to the questions that Ed mentioned, there is an active investigation. It's not, it's not. Just in general terms, the fact that State this Department This just occurred to you? No, well, it's because it's, it's State Department, it's Labor Department, it's Interior, mm -hmm. Homeland Security, Defense, and I think it's the Agency for, Intel, uh, for International Development, all mm -hmm. of which do not presently have full-time Inspector General, so it would be a broader question than posing. Okay. Well, I'll have to take the question. I appreciate it. Thank you. On, on a separate topic then, very briefly, I think Julie got to it quickly. On Plan B, I know that the situation has changed, but has the President's personal position on emergency contraception changed? The President's views are as he expressed them. Those are his personal views, and he, he, he put them in the context of being a father. Uh, and he supported, again, the decision that Secretary Sebelius made at the time. Uh, but the fact is, we, uh, you know, this case has been litigated. The, an appeals court has ruled against the administration, making available a uh, version of Plan B, uh, 
uh, immediately, and it is the view uh, of the administration that Given that ruling and the availability of Plan B, it is in uh, the best interests of uh, the country that the simpler version be made available. And uh, if you're familiar with the ruling and the two different versions of the medication, uh, I think that explains why we've taken the position we have. And on one final topic, the Democratic Senator uh, Wyden said of the Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, that he, quote, didn't give straight answers on the NSA surveillance during a hearing that took place in March. The President has called for open and honest debate. I think Wyden said specifically that the American people have the right to expect straight answers from uh, intelligence leadership to questions asked by their representation, by the representatives. Is the President satisfied that the American people are getting straight answers from their leadership uh, when it comes to American intelligence? Well, he certainly believes that uh, Director Clapper has been uh, straight and direct in the answers that he's given and has actively uh, engaged in an effort to uh, provide more information about the programs that have been revealed through the leak of classified information. Because even James Cla Clapper said it was the least untruthful statement. He acknowledged that it wasn't fully truthful. Well, I'm not sure which statement you're talking this about, Peter. This is the statement that I was referring to in the March hearing where he was asked specifically <clears throat> whether all, uh, I have the direct language, does the U.S. collect any type of data on all um, of the millions of Americans? And he said the answer to that was no, he later sort of amended it, but even in the conversation with Andrew Mitchell this weekend, he acknowledged that it was the least untruthful answer well, he could give. Look, I think Director Clapper has, and, and the last uh, week has demonstrated this, been aggressive in uh, providing as much information as possible uh, to the American people, to the press, about uh, these uh, very sensitive and very important programs uh, that are authorized by Congress under Section 702 and Section 215 of the Patriot Act, a public statute, uh, a much debated public statute that has been passed into law and reauthorized, I believe, three times by Congress with bipartisan majorities. Uh, and I would point you to the uh, statements and documents that have been put out by the ODNI that demonstrate uh, the effort that he has undertaken to provide a significant amount of information uh, uh, on these programs, uh, given the revelations that we've seen. Mark Miller, do you have something for me? Uh, yeah, let me ask you this. What advice would the White House give? To, I probably uh, am going to regret to, a, to an official or somebody with a uh, top secret clearance who thinks there's wrongdoing underway? What what uh, option does such an individual have to try and correct that? Uh, that's uh, that's do? a that's an important question, and I appreciate it. Uh, the uh, Obama administration has demonstrated a strong commitment to protecting whistleblowers. Whistleblowers can play an important role in exposing waste, fraud, and abuse. There are established procedures that whistleblowers can employ that also protect, uh, rather ensure protection of national security interests. Uh, and you know, I would, if you if you look at uh, the history here. Uh, the President appointed strong advocates to the Office of Special Counsel and the Merit Systems Protection Board uh, who have been widely praised. They have collectively issued an all-time high number of favorable actions on behalf of whistleblowers and have begun to change the culture so that whistleblowers are more willing to come forward. On November 27, 2012, after four years of work with advocates and, and Congress to reach a compromise, the President signed the Whistleblower <coughs> Protection Enhancement Act, uh, which provides whistleblower protections for federal employees by clarifying the scope of protected disclosures, expanding judicial review, expanding the penalties imposed by for violating whistleblower protections, creating new protections for transportation security officers and scientists, creating whistleblower ombudsmen, and strengthening the authority of the Office of Special Counsel to assist whistleblowers. Because it was clear that Congress would not provide protections for intelligence community whistleblowers, the President took executive action, issuing a landmark directive that extended whistleblower protections uh, to the intelligence and national security communities for the first time. The directive prohibits retaliation against whistleblowers who report information through the appropriate channels and established procedures, including a review panel of IGs of other agencies to ensure that such ret retaliation does not occur. The President's commitment on this issue far exceeds that of past administrations, which have resisted expanding protections for whistleblowers and in doing so have steered away from transparency. That was quite an off-the-cuff I answer. just happened to have this available. <laughs> Does the, uh, are you willing to say whether you see Snowden as a whistleblower or a leader? I am not willing to comment on the status of the individual under investigation. Roger. Thank you. Uh, is Sec Secretary 
Kerry participating in an NSC meeting tomorrow in Syria? I think I was asked this yesterday about yesterday. Yeah. Uh, I, I can simply tell you that we have uh, meetings here uh, on Syria with some regularity. Uh, I'm not going to give a readout or preview of every meeting we have. But given uh, the seriousness of the situation there and the importance of Syria with regards to American policy, you can be sure that we have regular meetings on these issues uh, that involve uh, both principals and deputies uh, uh, on the National Security Council. Again, I don't have a specific meeting to announce from here uh, because they're fairly frequent, frequent and routine. Fair to say that the White House is edging closer toward a decision meeting? Uh, again, I don't have any decisions or announcements to make about policy except to say that the President is uh, constantly reviewing the options available to him and tasking his team to review those options with an eye towards uh, what actions we might take would bring us closer to the achievement of the goal that we seek. And one other topic on Snowden. Can you describe a little bit about the damage he has caused? Uh, I think I would uh, refer you to the statements by the Director of National Intelligence, who is in a position to better assess that uh, at the outset, and note that um, more comprehensive damage assessments are being done. It is without question uh, a matter of significant concern when we see leaks of highly classified information about very sensitive programs uh, that are classified for a reason, that they uh, are uh, important to our effort to combat uh, terrorists and extremists and those who uh, seek to do harm to our nation and take the lives of the American people. So, uh, but for more specific assessments, I would refer you to uh, the ODNI. Any idea how long that damage assessment? I, I'm not sure. I would, I would ask them. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you, Jay. Two quick questions on Syria again. Um, mm -hmm. You reminded us that the president is constantly reviewing his options. And it's the same thing in the European capitals and Ottawa, too. Uh, is there any um, concerted NATO option there? Well, I, I don't have a list of options to review for you. Since they're all on the table, uh, I guess you could assume that any option you might ask me about within reason and logic would be on the table. What we tend to talk about here are, uh, you know, what actions might be taken in, uh, in response to uh, assessments, uh, more corroborated evidence about the use of chemical weapons, for example, uh, what actions might be taken with regards to uh, further assistance to the Syrian opposition uh, given the uh, circumstances in Syria and given the assessments we constantly make about what the impact of a decision like that uh, would be. Uh, but I, I'm, I, I'm not going to, uh, you know, weigh in on specific options and whether they're being considered because, as the President has said, um, with uh, a caveat on the exception of, on the option of putting boots on the ground, the President has said all options remain on the table. But therefore, there, there are discussions also with, are there, with? Uh... We talk about this issue with our allies and partners all the time uh, because it is of such great concern to the President uh, and, you know, American political leaders in general as well as uh, the leaders uh, in the countries of our allies and partners who have grave concerns about what's happening in Syria, grave concerns about the impact of the violence in Syria on the region concerns about the involvement of Hezbollah and Iran in uh, the fighting in Syria on behalf of Bashar al-Assad. Uh, these are all matters that are of serious concern beyond the borders of Syria. Okay, uh, can you tell me if the State Department review report on Keystone XL is on the President's desk? Again, that's a process that is operated out of the State Department, and I would refer you to the State Department for updates on anything. Uh, Again, I think you, you should take that question to the State Department. Okay. Sure. Yes, Nadia. Uh, follow up on Syria again. Considering the military gain achieved by the Syrian government, what makes you confident that Geneva II will take place altogether? And second, the U.S. is conducting military exercise with Jordan, around 8,000 personnel. Is this a, a plan B for Syria? I mean, different kind of plan B. Let me refer first to the, uh, that's clever, uh, refer first to the question about Jordan. Uh, Jordan is a close friend and ally 
uh, to the United States, and our militaries in particular have a longstanding relationship. In reference to your question, a Patriot missile battery and F-16s are in Jordan in support of our annual joint uh, exercise, Eagle Lion, uh, and and that is uh, again an annual exercise. So it is not uh, related to uh, Syria or proposed options in Syria. On the first question, as I noted earlier, there is a concern here and elsewhere about the deteriorating situation there about the involvement of Hezbollah and Iran in uh, the fight in Syria on behalf of Assad. Uh, and the President is reviewing the options available to him uh, when it comes to American policy and working with our allies and partners uh, on ways that we can assist the Syrian people and assist the Syrian opposition in trying to achieve the goal that we've stated, which is a peaceful transition uh, to a post-Assad Syria, uh, to a, an authority in place in Syria that respects the rights of all Syrians, that protects conventional and unconventional weapons, uh, that uh, combats terrorism and terrorists. Uh, and, and, and it is in pursuit of that goal that we evaluate the options available to us. I know that, but what makes you confident that the Assad government will participate in Geneva too? Oh, on the Geneva question, we are, as you know, working to convene a conference as soon as practical, which means as soon as it is determined in partnership with the United Nations and with our international partners uh, that we have done the necessary preparations to bring the parties together and move forward towards a political solution. And we are pursuing this. And we're pursuing a conference in Geneva, but we are not pursue that is not the, the one track we're pursuing here. Uh, you know, the political process cannot occur in a vacuum. There is ongoing fighting in Syria. That is why uh, we have, uh, even as we continue our discussions with our uh, allies, with the Russians, with the opposition about Geneva, the situation on the ground means that we continue to explore what more we can do to support the opposition uh, as it uh, confronts the tyranny of Bashar al-Assad. China summit? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Don, NSA Donnelly on Saturday had said that the President was going to follow the summit with some conversations with U.S. allies in Asia, and that Donnelly himself was going to have some meetings with representatives from those countries today. Have any of those conversations happened yet? Can you tell us anything about that? Uh, I have no presidential uh, interactions to read out to you, and I'll have to check about uh, the National Security Advisor. Did you expect anything today? Again, I just don't know. I'll have to take, uh, I'll have to take the question. Jay, on the NSA yeah. thing, um, it's obviously a, a big deal. You've got members of the President's own party questioning what the DNI said about this. Um, you know, this clearly has repercussions that are far more significant than some of the other things we've talked about in the briefing room. Isn't it time for the President to address the American people directly? Uh, isn't this sort of a, a litmus of leadership to tell people when you're taking them in a new direction? and when they're confronted with these, these various challenges? Uh, well, Glenn, uh, the President took uh, questions and answered them at length uh, on this specific issue on Friday. How, uh, how many and, questions did he take? Uh, he, he, I think he answered for a total of 14 minutes, two, two like, multi-part questions on these issues that probably, uh, given the standards here, that's six or eight questions. And the uh, fact of the matter is he will continue to discuss this, and he will continue. He is, he is interested in and believes that it is in a debate about these issues and believes it's uh, worthy and important to engage in that debate. And, debate. and I would just note, as I did uh, earlier, that prior to these revelations, the President addressed this specific issue uh, in a speech at the National Defense well, University. Well, about the magnitude of this. Well, oh, so you're saying you weren't interested until, until there so were the revelations. Most, Amer but, most Americans were not aware of this. Don't you, you think, uh, hold on, former, hey, Glenn, former Attorney General Let me just McKenzie, say that yeah. uh, P Patriot Act, which I know you've heard of, is a public statute. There is spirited and animated debate about the reauthorization of the Patriot Act every time it comes off for reauthorization, which includes most recently in 2011. And the provisions under which, the sections of the law under which these programs exist uh, have been and are debated, and they have been, uh, since the first reauthorization, updated in a way that made sure that oversight that did not exist over programs in the previous administration, uh, in the first years of the previous administration, uh, does exist. And that was uh, at the insistence of lawmakers, including then Senator Obama, that that kind of enhanced oversight uh, by the, all three branches of government 
take place and exist with programs that are vital to our national security. Former Attorney General Mike Mukasey, Mukasey has said uh, that the President ought to have a fireside chat with the American people about this. Why not do that? I mean, is Well, I'm not saying that I think I just said, Glenn, although I appreciate yours and the former Attorney General's specific recommendations about the modalities of presidential communication, that the President has and will speak about this subject. Yes, Chair. Jay, you, you just said now to Glenn, and, and to answers today and yesterday, you refer us back to the President's speech at National Defense University. Nowhere in that speech does the President specifically address the use of private contractors, either for intelligence or for any of the other initiatives that the President was looking to address. Is the President... Jared, I think you're... You've kind of missed the big story here, but the... the I, I grant that there's a question here about contractors, but the focus of the, the president, the, pre the focus of the president about conversation, the, about the conversation we've been having here, is the balance between our security interests and our desire for privacy. Right. And, and the question I was trying to ask was that, is right. the president looking at this as an opportunity to re-examine the proportion or depth that private contractors have, in t including in our intelligence community? Well, I think that's a, that, that is an interesting question and perhaps worthy of uh, debate as part of this conversation that we should be having. I would note that contractors have long been involved in uh, both our defense and intelligence uh, efforts, and that when it comes to security clearances, they are subject to the same uh, system of checks and uh, security clearance uh, procedures as government employees. And But again, I, which is not to be at all dismissive of the question, because I think uh, that too is a, a certainly a question that is uh, merits debate. Uh, but, the, but the issue is, if, you are, if you're a private contractor and you take an oath to uh, handle and protect classified information, you are under the same obligations as I am and Josh is and others here uh, who have security clearances. So uh, the, the legal protections and the legal regime is the same and the obligations are the same. But in an hour at National Defense University, the President didn't specifically mention private contractors once. and. This is now. You, you say that he yeah, wants I, to have. Wait, you say that he wants to have the conversation. Sure, I, I appreciate. I'm not sure that w what point you're trying to make. The president gave a lengthy speech that I'm was asking, about I'm specific asking, issues like the use of directed. Point, because you keep cutting me off. I, I'm saying that, <laughs> that what I'm trying to ask is the president didn't mention specifically contractors. I, you've said that. The now. vacuum <laughs> in the vacuum in the vacuum of that that omission. The Snowden incident has filled that gap, and so the president wants to have the conversation. Does this conversation begin now on the contractors issue, which is up to 70 percent of intelligence gathering in some capacities? Doesn't that open a door that the president had left closed? No. I think that that is an, uh, that is an issue, as I think I said in answer to your partial questions, uh, that merits debate. But the whether it's a a private contractor or a government employee, the issue of classified information and the obligations that individuals who take an oath to protect it have is the same, one. Two, it is certainly worth a d discussion. There has been discussion and debate in the past about uh, you know, the use of contractors in, in various other parts of the, the government, uh, and that's certainly worth debate. But when it comes to the issue of protecting our privacy and protecting our security, uh, the, the, the balance that we seek remains uh, the central issue, regardless of uh, the employment status of individuals who take the oath to protect classified information. Cheryl. Okay. Um, Jay, on immigration, um, the President this morning talked about maybe potential changes to the bill. Senator McConnell is looking for what he terms major changes in the areas of border security, benefits, <coughs> and taxes. Is the President open to major changes to this bill? The President gave remarks about immigration reform just a few hours ago and made the point that the bill that emerged from the Senate Judiciary Committee represents uh, an extraordinary amount of hard work by a bipartisan group of United States Senators, uh, a process that in committee that allowed consideration of numerous amendments and passage of amendments with bipartisan support. It does not represent, letter for letter, exactly what the President wants, nor does it represent, letter for letter, exactly what any individual Republican lawmaker or Democratic lawmaker wants. But it does represent a strong consensus position uh, on the central principles that the President laid out when it comes to comprehensive immigration reform, and we strongly support that bill. The 
uh, and we look forward to a process that begins today of consideration on the Senate floor of comprehensive immigration reform. And we sincerely hope uh, that as this bill is debated and as amendments are considered, that the uh, significant majority of lawmakers in the Senate who support comprehensive immigration reform, reflecting the support that's out there in the American public and the views of the President, uh, prevail over any efforts to sabotage that when we have, as the President said, a unique opportunity to address this challenge for the first time in many, many years. And we do not want to miss that opportunity, an opportunity that will uh, be good for the middle class, be good for our businesses, uh, be good for our security. On one of the issues that is frequently raised uh, when it comes to immigration reform, border security, it is important to note, A, that we have taken significant steps to enhancing our border security since President Obama took office. We have, uh, uh, I think, <coughs> the most uh, boots on the ground on the border uh, that we've ever had as a nation, and we've doubled the number of uh, Border Patrol agents. Uh, and in addition to that, the bill itself that the Senate passed out of committee represents uh, the most significant border security bill in our history uh, in terms of resources allocated towards further border security. Uh, and that's very important. It also makes clear that we have to have a clear path to citizenship for the 11 million uh, uh, illegals in this country, uh, Im illegal immigrants in this country, uh, and that that path has to be clear uh, because that's the right thing to do for our businesses and for the middle class and for our economy. So the President, as you heard him say today, looks forward to a healthy debate in the Senate as they consider this important legislation, uh, looks forward to bipartisan passage of that bill uh, in the Senate and then consideration in the House uh, and ultimately passage by the full Congress. Thank you. Jay. Jay. Um, Jay, does the President believe that the government is currently striking the right balance between privacy and security? Is it getting it right? And if so, why? And if not, which way should it tell more privacy? The security? president has addressed this, and so I will paraphrase him by saying yes. The president believes that. Thanks. Thank you, Glenn. The uh, the president believes that uh, we are striking the right balance, in his view, through a uh, through programs that are subject, uh, first of all, to debate consideration and passage by Congress, and then subject to an oversight, oversight regime that involves all three branches of government. And, uh, you know, again, I think it's important, whether it's Section 702 or 215, to be fully aware of the kind of oversight uh, that exists uh, when it comes to these programs. And I'd like to, at this late date, or late moment in my briefing, uh, to remind you of some of that. Uh, oversight that exists, if I have it here, which I may not. Why welcome the <laughs> why, why invite all the debate? Mm -hmm. um, if there is this debate now, your position is Because the President's known. made clear that, that he does not believe that uh, just because he has come to the conclusion that we have struck the balance, uh, that is the right balance, uh, that that should end debate. Uh, he believes that this is a subject where uh, well-meaning and thoughtful uh, people can disagree and that we ought to have that debate. And we certainly uh, are having it now and we should continue to have it. Uh, but what I think is important to note, uh, as we've seen these revelations, uh, is that there is a system in place with regards to these two programs that ensures that there is oversight by uh, the judicial branch by the legislative branch and by the executive branch uh, to make sure that these programs, as they are implemented, are done so in a way that is consistent with the law uh, and with the guidelines that exist to ensure that there aren't, uh, uh, you know, that they're not, they don't run afoul of our laws or values. Uh, and depending on the programs, you know, the, the, the 215 program we talked about that is subject to uh, renewal every 90 days uh, through the courts. It is briefed and reviewed by Congress. Uh, and, and again, similarly with 702, there are procedures for both uh, uh, requirements for judicial consent and review and for congressional 
uh, review and notification and updates. Uh, additionally, there are procedures in place in the executive branch uh, for monitoring these programs to ensure that in the implementation of the authorities granted by Congress, um, those who uh, carry out these programs are doing so in a way that's consistent with our law uh, and with the, uh, the values and the oversight regime that's in place. Thanks very much, guys.